All right, welcome everyone. My name is Charles Jensen. I'm a senior vice president with Inland Securities Corporation, uh, coming to you live from Santa Monica, California this morning. Um, I'm joined by our, our list of panelists and Mr. Evan Lydiard. I just want to kind of introduce our panelists as we get started here. Again, my name is Charles Jensen. We have Steve Decker, uh, Senior Vice President with IPX 1031 Exchange. We have Bill Exeter, uh, CEO of Exeter 1031 Exchange. We have Mr. Dan Wagner, our Senior Vice President of Government Relations on our panel today. Colin Cosgrove, our Senior Vice President, Executive Vice President with Inland Securities Corporation on the phone as well. As well as Keith Lampy, the President of Inland Private Capital Corporation. So our goal today is to talk about the 1031 exchange. We know there's been a change uh, in administration. There's been a change in Congress recently. And our goal today is to talk to you about uh, the future of the 1031 exchange and how we see uh, this all panning out. Uh, to start out, I wanna to talk to you about who Inland is really fast. Um, if you live in California, this is a national presentation, but if you're in California, you hear the word Inland, you think the Inland Empire. But we're actually located in Oak Brook, Illinois started by four Chicago teachers back in the 60s. These teachers met in teaching school, decided to su supplement their income uh, by buying some real estate together in a real estate group. Uh, one deal turned to two, two turned to four. Uh, next thing you know, the Inland Real Estate Group of Companies was formed. We incorporated in 1968. We bought retail, office, industrial, apartments, medical, um, storage facilities, you name it over the years. And by 1989, and they became the largest landlord of Walmart nationwide. Best part of the story is all four of those four former teachers are still there today. Uh, one is the former head of sales, one is the head of acquisitions, one's the chief legal counsel, and the other is the chairman and CEO. Inland is very well known in the 1031 exchange arena. We are uh, the largest sponsor of Delaware statutory trust in the nation. Um, we want to bring this presentation to you today uh, to bring you more education as to 1031 exchanges, what's happening in Congress, what's happening in government in general. Um, this is an educational series we'll be doing every month of the year. I want to bring in uh, Dan Wagner. Dan is our head of government relations for Inland. He is our uh, tip of the spear, if you will, in DC. We've actually run to each other before in the halls of Congress and he's there fighting for us um, all the time. And he's part of, of various boards uh, nationally. Dan, I turn it over to you. Charles, thanks so much. Uh, Charles, everybody should know, is one of my favorite people in the world. Uh, love you, Charles. I wanted to, uh, to highlight, so my job at Inland, is, I'm kind of like the Tom Sawyer of Inland. I get all of our associations to paint the fence for us. And one of the most important associations that exists, uh, that Inland's a part of, is the National Association of Realtors. Uh, Mr. Goodwin, um, our chairman and CEO, uh, recognized a long time ago that the realtors are really the most, uh, power, one of the most powerful organizations that exists. And if we're going to be successful as a company, we need to be involved with the realtors. So um, as we're the, one of the largest commercial realtor association organizations involved with the realtors, Mr. Goodwin is in the uh, Hall of Fame for the, the National Association, for uh, the Illinois Association, and for the Chicago Association of Realtors, and received the Good Neighbor Award for his work on affordable housing from the National Association. So we have this very long standing relationship with uh, just such a, a quality, high caliber group. And we're so honored. Uh, because of that relationship, um, I'm very proud to let you know we have a lot of uh, friends and I, a personal friend of mine who also happens to be one of the main leaders of the National Association is our guest speaker today, Evan Lydiard. Um, it's just my honor to introduce such a high caliber, gold-plated human being as Evan. Evan uh, worked on the Hill for Orrin Hatch for 20 years um, in charge of uh, tax when uh, Orrin Hatch was the Senate, the chairman of the Senate Finance Committee. So he knows the inner workings of Washington better than anybody. And then the other aspect of Evan is he's really super smart. Um, he has incredible degrees, CPA, all these backgrounds. He's also a professor at American University uh, in his evening time. So um, Evan, uh, on a personal, a personal note as well, uh, a couple of fun things. He took a sabbatical last year, was in Antarctica this time last year. And his hobby is to travel around to all the different uh, courthouses in America, which is, I think, uh, makes him even uh, extra cool because I, uh, I love history too. So without any further ado, um, the reason why the 1031 was saved last time um, in the United States, and now the reason who's, the person who's going to help save the 1031 this time, uh, none other than Evan Lydiard. So Evan, take it away. 
Well, Dan, thank you. As usual, you're very effusive, but I, we love you. Everybody does. Uh, thank you all for, for inviting me to be with you today. I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased to do so. To talk about 1031 at this really unprecedented and interesting time. Uh, on the next slide, we see an outline of what I'm hoping to cover today. We're going to focus on the policy background of 1031 life kindness changes and try to answer the questions of whether and why the provision might be in trouble in Washington this year. Next, I'll explain why I think we can save it through educating policymakers using data from some studies and real life 1031 examples. Then I'll give a brief overview of those studies. On the next slide, we see uh, something, uh, uh, most of you already know a lot about 1031 and how it works, but you may not be, all of you, fully aware of why it was included in the tax law in the first place. What we now know is section 1031 was first added to the Internal Revenue Code 100 years ago now. It had a different section number in those days, but this is where the principle and the idea got its start. And that idea it was tax deferral instead of tax realization and tax immediately due when one investment property is exchanged for another of like kind. And that was when an owner has changed the form of an investment, it's often in substance the same investment if he or she doesn't cash it in by keeping the proceeds or spending them on something else. In other words, if someone swaps one investment property for a similar one, what has really changed? Well, not. And one of the bedrock principles upon which the federal tax law was built is that tax should not be collected on gains until those gains are actually realized. This is why we don't have to pay capital gains tax when the stocks that we might own go up in value or when real estate is appraised higher this year than, than it was last year. Instead, the, the law generally waits until the owner has the cash in hand from the sale so they can have the cash to pay the tax. This is why 1031 requires that if cash is received as part of a like kind of exchange transaction, that portion known as boot will be recognized as, as a gain and the tax will be due then. But for the portion that continues to be invested, the gain is not recognized and the tax is deferred until such time that it is exchanged for cash. As you all know, the term tax-free exchange, like some detractors like to call it, is really a misnomer. Some critics also think that ta the tax deferred treatment of section 1031 is unique in the tax law, but that's simply not true. This same principle of, ch of changing the form but not the substance of investments is found in other places in the tax code as well. For example, when, when one incorporates a business or forms a partnership, we have exactly the same principle at work. Tax is not realized. The tax code recognizes that you just change the, the, the form of, the, of it and not the substance. Over the years, there have been various threats against 1031, with the most recent one occurring during the debate over the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017. And surprisingly, this one came from an unlikely source. Republicans in the House who were trying to make the tax law more friendly to economic growth and job creation. Because those House Republicans wanted to, who wanted to pass tax reform had a plan to immediately expense the purchase of all types of business assets, including land and buildings, they saw no need for like kind of exchanges to continue in the law. In short, we were able to preserve 1031 by showing them that even in a world with immediate expensing, the like kind of exchange was still needed because of timing differences. Of course, the immediate expensing did not happen when it came, comes to real estate anyway, so it's a good thing we saved it. The key really was in educating Capitol Hill as to how 1031 works in the real world. And as you know, 1031 was repealed in the 2017 Act for everything except real estate. Uh, this gets us to, on the next slide, this gets us to the basic question as to why we think 1031 like kind of exchanges are in trouble now. Well, where is this threat coming from? Well, I've been in the tax policy world since the mid 1980s. And for all this time, there has been a bullseye on the back of 1031 by those who think that tax incentives to invest in business property are simply loopholes reserved exclusively for wealthy individuals and corporations who generally aren't paying their fair share of tax. These ideas are fairly easy for lay people to accept when the facts surrounding 1031 are distorted or terms like tax-free exchanges 
and real estate moguls and developers are thrown around with derision. In short, the lack of understanding of how light kind exchanges work or the principles behind them make it easier to believe that perhaps improper tax breaks are being given out by a tax law tilted in favor of the rich. After all, most people are not well acquainted with concepts like capital gains, tax deferral, bases, and so forth, and the lack of understanding of how 1031 works or its purpose. So this makes it a lot easier to believe that it's improper and ought to be repealed. Another important point is listed on the last bullet on this slide. The current talk about possible repeal of 1031 is not a frontal attack by the Biden campaign that we saw last year, solely because they don't like the 1031, even though that may be true. Rather, 1031 repeal was included in the campaign proposal last year as a way to pay for it or offset the cost of new spending being proposed for somebody else. 1031 is being targeted mainly because money's needed to pay for uh, child care and elderly care, and like kind of changes looks like an easy target. That's the main reason we see this. And on the next slide, let's talk about uh, saving and the keys to saving it. I believe that preserving 1031 again really boils down to another education campaign of members of Congress and their staff. Even since 2017, there's been a lot of turnover on Capitol Hill, and especially among staff people. And you can't underestimate the impact of, of, of staffers, especially on the Senate side. The other thing to know about congressional staff is that most of them are very bright, but many are very, very young and inexperienced as to the business world. For most of them, the concept and terms surrounding like kind of changes will be brand new. And all they know about it is somebody says they ought to be repealed. So this education has to happen early and often, and it has to occur at both the member level and at the staff level. In my view, the gold standard for educating policymakers is to have at least one contact with the right staff person, who probably works in the Washington DC office as a member, and then another meeting with the member, ideally in his or her uh, state or district office. But the key to all of these meetings is to have solid people with home state or home district credentials and independent facts about the jobs and growth of real property that have been transformed in part by a like kind of exchange. These are the kind of meetings that dispel myths and misunderstandings of, about what 1031 does and is and shows why they're important to the district. Next week, we have a, a coalition that will begin again. It was, it was fully operating before the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act we're going to organize again and start organizing these kinds of meetings. And we'll be looking for people like those of you on this call who will be willing to tell good stories, to, to reach out to members of Congress and talk about how 1031 has made a difference in, in, in their hometown, in their home state, and then what that difference is, and that they're too valuable to be repealed. So along with that, we're gonna have some data and let's move to the next slide and we'll start talking about what what we have to show uh, members of, of Congress and their staff. We have these independent studies that you see here that can help us make the case for keeping 1031 for real estate in the tax law. And we basically have three sources of this that we call our primary ammunition. Now, general talking points can be helpful and we'll have those as well, but having independent data from these studies is always important in trying to convince policymakers who can be quite skeptical. So let's go through each one of these uh, briefly. The, the first one on the next slide is what we call the Ling Petrova study. And this is a name for two professors who are considered experts in like kind exchanges. David Ling is of the University of Florida and Melina Petrova of Syracuse University. And they've been working in this area for a long time. If we go to the next slide, we'll see but this, this study was first completed in 2015 and was instrumental in helping uh, us in talking with members and staff before the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. But because five years is a long time, our coalition funded an update to the study, which was completed last fall. And moving to the next slide, you'll see that the goals were first to get documentation on just how, I think we need to go to the previous slide actually. Uh, yes. Uh, get documentation on just how many like kind of changes there are out there. Second, they wanted to quantify certain factors about 1031 
exchanges and, and uh, using an analytical model they created to help show how the exchanges impact the real estate sector of the economy. And then finally, the third element was to draw what conclusions could be taken from an empirical analysis of the data to see what benefits could be identified. And now we'll move to the second next slide and take a quick look at where the data for the study came from. There were four sources, and the most extensive one was the CoStar database. But they also used data from the leading exchange accommodator and the recent NAR uh, member survey that we'll talk about in a moment. Over the 10 year period from 2010 to 2020, the professors looked at over 800,000 transactions that had a median price of 1.1 million. Like kind exchanges represented about 6% of these transactions. However, based on other sources such as the NAR survey, the study concludes that the actual share of like kind exchanges is much higher and that they're more likely to be in the 10 to 20% range of all these transactions. And they also conclude very significantly that most of these are smaller transactions, which goes against what many misconceptions are that these are all being done by fat cat corporations and, and huge real estate developers. That is not the case at all. Uh, on the next slide, we see a distribution of a breakdown of the kinds of real property that were being exchanged. And uh, this is not gonna be a surprise to any of you because you, you're very aware of the kinds, but this is a widespread uh, representation of these transactions and they're happening. These are the things that are happening in every town city in America, plus out in the country as well. Uh, the next slide shows uh, the fascinating view of, of where the top areas for 1031s are located. Now, this is a little bit hard to read, but you can see that the, these are, are scattered around, but particularly in the West, it's, it's quite uh, prevalent. And it's also fascinating to see on the next slide where the top areas, uh, the, uh, the, the state level data. Are you surprised to see that California has nearly 40% of all uh, 1031 transactions and that the top dozen states listed have more than three quarters of all the like kind exchanges in the, in the nation. However, they, they're everywhere. These are just where they're most prevalent. Uh, Going to the next slide, you'll, you'll see something you're not going to be surprised with, and that is that the Ling Petroba study concluded that repealing 1031 will not bring in nearly as much revenue as might be hoped for by its proponents. But why is that? Well, I think you could tell me. And that is that many people who otherwise might sell if they could defer the gain will decide not to sell if they have to pay the tax. Usually a capital asset is not something they have to, to, to sell. They don't need the money. They, they will sell it when there's a good opportunity to, to get something else, but usually it's not going to happen if, if they have to pay tax. And the professors also concluded that repealing it will also make the, the market less efficient, which could lead to lower prices in some markets and could hurt employment in real estate and related sectors. Uh, the conclusion for the study, if you look at the uh, next slide, and on the empirical evidence is that uh, first 1031s are very, very common. But most, more importantly, they're associated with increased investment, reduced leverage, and shorter holding periods, all good things for the economy. And on the next slide, it shows the rationale for like kind exchanges. I'm not going to go through that. You, you're already familiar with why it's important. But I do want to highlight the last point that you may not be as familiar with, the one in the yellow there, which is a valuable one to make to those on the Hill who are skeptical about the idea that most people never pay deferred tax from a like kind exchange. The study actually found that in 87% of the cases, a like kind exchange is followed by a taxable sale. And in general, more tax is ultimately paid than if the exchange had never occurred. And that's because they've created something more valuable. And then they, they a lot of times they go in and they, they, they do another exchange or they, they've created something big and sell it and pay more tax. This is really helpful when we're explaining this on the Hill. Let me shift gears now and talk about the next survey on the next slide. And that's the NAR survey that we updated. Uh, one more slide, please. This was an update of a similar survey that our association did back in 2015. Interestingly, both the Ling Petrova study and the EY study I'm about to talk about use these results as source material because it's such a, a large sample. Uh, next slide shows that the big news here is that a high percentage of NAR members 
have been involved in the white kind exchange uh, in the past four years, either for their clients or for themselves. And this makes sense when you think about it because there's so many rental homes and small apartment buildings out there, plus relatively small commercial buildings where, where realtors are often involved. And also attest once more that these are Main Street, not Wall Street type transactions. And the next slide shows the positive views that, that NAR members have uh, for 1031. The stress that even though this survey is of our own members, it carries a lot of weight on the hill because realtors are well respected. Every member has thousands of realtors in their state and district and they, and they know who they are. They see them all the time and they're, they're, uh, they're not shy. Let's now go to the last study, which is the Ernst & Young study. And here uh, we'll be talking about uh, the, uh, the new one, even though this is still based on the 2015. This is fundamentally different than the Ling Petrova study in that it takes a look at the impact of 1031 on the entire economy and on GDP. In other words, it's a macroeconomic study where Ling and Petrova is a microeconomic study. Next slide shows and lays out the main points about this original EY study. They concluded that repealing 1031 would raise taxes on businesses and would thus have a negative impact on gross domestic product. Now these numbers are not huge. They're big numbers, of course, but compared to the economy, they're not huge, but they're still significant. And for the debate we had in 2017, which was a tax reform that was designed to grow the economy and create jobs, it clearly went in the wrong direction because this shows that it doesn't grow the economy. It shrinks the economy and it loses jobs. And so for a bill that was designed to do the opposite, we, we could go in and say, look, this has no place in a bill like this. And a number of members had to agree with us. This time around, we can point to the fact that the commercial real estate sector has already been suffering and it's on the ropes and emphasize that the last thing we need right now is more negative numbers to make it even worse. Next slide will show us uh, what these numbers were for the 2015 study. And, and I think it'll be just as helpful this time as it was that time. One more slide, uh, this last one, will uh, it shows that it also confirmed the impact on the expected revenue was not going to be there. Uh, if you repeal it, you're not going to be bringing in the money that, uh, that the Joint Committee on Taxation is expecting because uh, behavior is going to be uh, not following along. In other words, for the same reason, people aren't going to, to sell if they have to pay the tax. The next slide shows the differences in the, uh, oops, I'm sorry, just stay on the same slide for a second if you would. This is uh, how the, the 2020 study is going to be a little bit different. It's going to be focusing on the, uh, the, the current economy as opposed to the booming economy we had uh, four or five years ago. And uh, also is going to also take into account the fact that a lot of commercial real estate is, is in trouble right now. So that'll all be uh, taken into account and we expect that we're going to see this finalized study in the next few weeks and we'll be able to start sharing it at that particular time. Uh, okay, the next slide now, please. I'm not going to repeat everything here, but uh, I will emphasize that these two studies and the survey complement each other and are great to have together in a package and, and deliver a solid story for why 1031 is different from what the myths say and what the people on the Hill might be, have been believing before they came in and uh, let us talk to them. When this information is delivered by respected lobbyists or even better yet, by people from their home state or district who understand uh, the business in that area and can point to particular uh, 1031s that are taking place that have been positive, it is really effective in changing minds or in bolstering the viewpoint of members of Congress. I've been in meetings like that, I've seen it happen, and I, I think that's what we're going to be looking for to the extent we can do it. And with that, I will uh, see what questions that the panel has. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you, Evan, for that uh, in-depth uh, coverage there. The first set of questions will come from uh, Mr. Stephen Decker. He's a senior vice president with uh, IPX 1031 Exchange. Uh, go ahead, Stephen. I'll mute your line. Thanks, Charles. Uh, Evan, we really appreciate you, you, you being here with us today. Um, you know, we, we obviously appreciate you saving or helping save our careers here. Um, 
one of the questions, you know, being a, a QI out on the front lines, one of the major questions that I'm getting is about if if the the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act was repealed, what would happen? Would that bring back personal property exchanges to us? And and what would the effect be on opportunity zones on a going forward basis? Good question. We hear that kind of stuff all the time, but uh, it's, in order to repeal the, the, the 2017 Act, they would have to go through and reverse every individual provision. And that is just highly unlikely to be the case. Instead, those who didn't like the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act are much more likely to focus in on those parts uh, that they really didn't like, such as the huge in, uh, decrease in the corporate tax rate and the lowering of the top individual tax rate and target those areas and uh, not likely to go through and, and make a, a, a change of everything that ha took place. And so I don't think, I don't see opportunity zones going away. There could be some changes on the margins with them. And I don't see uh, the 1031 uh, restoring the uh, anything but real estate. I appreciate that. And the, the next question that, that I'm getting a lot out there is about, um, you know, the step up in basis. A, a lot of people have been saying, you know, that, that Biden has it in, in the crosshairs or the Biden administration has it in their crosshairs to eliminate that step up in basis. Um, you know, is there a realistic shot that that would occur? And, and you know, what kind of impact would that have on the, the real estate economy as a whole? Well, we're, that's a great question, too. We're, we're concerned about it as well, because the Biden campaign did list it as a possibility for a change that they'd like to see for higher income taxpayers. But of course, higher income taxpayers are often the ones that own the real estate. And so we're concerned. In fact, we've joined a coalition on that very topic, uh, watching out for changes. And, and there's a study underway, also by Ernst & Young, that would, that would uh, try to point to the economic impact of doing away with the step up in basis. So as far as timing and, and how likely it is, I don't see anything like that happening in, in immediate future, meaning the next six months. Uh, it looks like Congress is going to be focusing on further COVID relief in the next little while. And as part of that, I don't see any or many tax increases going along with that. Later in the year, assuming the economy bounces back and they don't think it's, it's terribly dangerous to raise taxes at that time, that's when we have to be even more on the lookout for things like step up in basis or other changes to the capital gains rules. And so uh, we're wary of them, but I don't think it's imminently in danger at this point, but uh, we can't take it off the, the endangered list, I don't think. I appreciate that, thank you. Uh, th thank you, Steve, for all your support as well and, and IPX uh, for all you guys do. Um, our next panelist questions will come from Mr. Bill Exeter. He is the CEO of Exeter 1031 Exchange. Bill, I'll bring you on and uh, you're unmuted already. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. And thank you for sharing your insight, Evan. It's much appreciated. Um, as you know, and actually, as you stated, uh, many investors would simply just not sell if 1031 exchanges were eliminated or, or even minimized, if you will. Uh, there'd be a direct negative impact in, on the economy and a reduction in, in tax revenue. Uh, has Congress uh, ever considered the impact on the local economies, like the reduction of documentary transfer taxes and recording fees and uh, the uh, uh, really lack of reassessment for property tax purposes that this would actually cause? So cities, counties, and states. Well, that's a great, that's a great question, Bill. And uh, my guess is that while, while they may be aware of those factors, that's not going to be their main consideration. It's, it's unbelievable to me uh, over the years just how much uh, congressional policy is driven by by the tax revenue that the federal government either get or lose, uh, the, the so-called score that the Joint Committee on Taxation gives to these. And that that is the, the main consideration. There may be states that are weighing in saying, hey, this is really going to hurt us at home. But they, they've got to uh, find a way to, to thread a needle with the, the numbers they have from the federal treasury. And so the stuff going on the state and the local is going to very definitely be a secondary consideration. And many of them won't be aware of it. And historically, you know, the party in control of the White House usually doesn't do well in the midterm elections. How might that shift uh, the balance of power in 2022 and beyond? And, uh, you know, could the, the GOP regain control of the House or, or Senate? Well, because the numbers are so slim now, the majority is so slim, and the times are so volatile, anything could happen. And it's certainly not a long shot to see that the Republicans could take control. 
especially at the house, but uh, the Senate, I think it might be a little bit tougher because they've got more seats that are up, but who can predict? And, and you're right, the, the midterm elections typically do go against the, the occupant of the, of the White House. And so two years could be a whole different ball game, but uh, two years is a long time when you're talking to be facing down uh, possible tax increases. And just one more quick question too. What do you think the timing would look like here? So as we get into this new administration, they're rolling things out. Uh, do we think they're going to try to make some of these changes in the first year or two, or is this more after the midterms? Well, if they had, if all conditions were ideal, the, the, the president has a certain amount of political capital that says it's maximum during the first nine to 12 months of, of the administration. And so that's the time to try to get big changes through. And there's no accident that major tax bills have come in the first year of, of a president's term when that capital is high. But the times right now are a lot different than with us having a major uh, recession and a problem. The, the priority is clearly right now with the Biden administration to try to get the, uh, get the pandemic under control and try to, to uh, get some relief out for those who are suffering. And, and tax increases probably don't um, meet that right now. And, and we've heard from a number of uh, uh, important players that they're, they're not looking at, at big tax increases in the immediate future. But rather, uh, I, I don't think it kicks it down to the, the, the second two years of the term either. I think it's more likely that we'd see action later this year, assuming we have a stronger economy, or into 2022. I, I don't see this being uh, something in the third or fourth year of, of a Biden uh, first term. If, there, if there's another term, I think it's more likely to be the second year. Thank you, Evan. Our next panelist is uh, Keith Lampy, president of Inland Private Capital. And actually, I'm going to ask Keith a question first. This, this is going to go to Keith. Uh, Keith, what would happen to the Delaware Statutory Trust um, if, exchangers, if exchanges went away? It's a, it's a big question. It's a good one. Thanks for the... Uh, Start me off with a nice warm-up question there. Um, and it's obviously something we've spent a, a fair amount of time thinking about over the years. Uh, this time around is no different. Um, you know, and I think the best way to answer that is to think about first the, the substance and, and kind of why we, why we structure deals through this, uh, the Delaware Statutory Trust. And, and you know, in many instances, we talk about the restrictions uh, of that particular structure, the seven deadly sins, the you know, the impediment that investment managers have in terms of not being able to, to refinance or recapitalize properties. So by and large, the, the structure is thought about as a buy, hold, and sell structure. So I think the concern that, and, and I've been getting this question a lot, the concern a lot of investors have is, will I, if I get into a DST or I'm in a DST and 1031 is repealed or, or adversely modified, will I eventually be forced into a taxable transaction? Um, and, and the way we kind of think about that is, again, we, we go at great pains, great lengths to preserve our, our 1031 treatment by, by following the, uh, the, the rigid rules of not refinancing, not, not modifying that investment structure. And I think if, if 1031 on the back end was no longer in play, you'd see the investment management strategy modified accordingly. In many respects, going back to the, the question and comment Bill made, you know, it would be a let's figure out a way to hold on to assets longer so that we don't, we don't uh, force that taxable event. Um, so you'd likely see springing LLCs. You might see a series of uh, roll-ups through Section 721 through the creation of you know, a variety of different uh, fund-like structures that were strategy-specific with the mindset of hanging on to assets longer, recapitalizing them, and, and likely, you know, it could be a product development and innovation that we could bring to the table whereby through that recapitalization exercise, we'd be able to provide liquidity on a rolling basis to that small subset of investors that desired it uh, on an ongoing basis. But again, uh, you know, obviously we wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't look at things the same way if, if uh, the ability to do a subsequent exchange was no longer on the table because we realize investors wouldn't want us to sell assets in the near term. and, and you know, we'd have to kind of respond accordingly. Um, you know, the, the takeaway I leave people with is, you know, at the end of the day, it comes down to the real estate. If the real estate's good, uh, you know, by modifying the structure, uh, we should be able to provide strong risk-adjusted performance in a different way, in a, in a different vehicle or wrapper, if you will. Thanks, Keith. I know you have a couple questions for Mr. Lidard as well. 
I do. I do. Evan, thanks so much for the presentation. I thought you did a, a really thorough job covering a lot of ground there. Um, big question we're getting a lot and, and we're seeing a lot of, uh, a lot of transaction volume currently and we're coming off some uh, record setting years in the industry. Um, if I'm an investor completing a tax deferred exchange today, what, what's the likelihood of there being a retroactive uh, kind of look back or claw back uh, if, if 1031 is repealed? So, you know, just use the example, if, if I'm doing a tax deferred exchange in January of 2021 and something happens in the tail end of the year, is, is, is it possible that, that Congress makes any sort of modification to the tax code retroactive to say the first of, first of the year? I don't want to say it's impossible, but it's highly unlikely. The retroactive tax increases are, are, are constitutional, but they're, they're rare because members of Congress hate, hate disappointing their constituents that way and surprising them. They don't mind doing tax cuts on a retroactive tax basis, but they wouldn't want to raise their taxes. Uh, but the earliest changes I've seen have been uh, a day of enactment of the bill. And that's after there's a lot of notice. People know that Congress is working on something and it could change after they enact it. But the idea of going back before they even started dealing with the bill, that, that's almost unheard of. I don't think you have to worry about that. Um, my guess and my hope that if we did get to that awful situation where 1031 were repealed, it would be totally prospective starting the next year. But uh, I'm convinced we, don't have to, we won't be there. And I'm almost certain that it won't be retroactive if it does happen. That's a huge sigh of relief, probably for a lot of people on the line. So thank you for that. Well, that go comment. ahead and that's do them now. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't hesitate to do a 1031 today. That's that's great feedback. I appreciate it. Uh, one last question for you. Again, hypothetically, you know, we're talking about kind of what if circumstances surrounding an outright repeal. Um, you know, we have also heard little rumblings throughout the the course of time around a a modification that might limit uh, an investor's ability to defer taxes. Um, and, and most of those, most of those uh, rumors, if you will, or, or, or sound bites, weren't all that, all that positive either, at least from my perspective. So, you know, Biden campaign uh, kind of lobbied on, you know, we're not going to raise taxes on anyone making more than 400000 a year. And that $400,000 figure was kind of glommed onto as to, you know, how might that interact with a modification and a limitation. And then thinking all the way back, I think the Obama administration uh, talked about capping 1031s to a million per taxpayer per year. Is that is that being talked about? How how should we be thinking about that as an industry? Or or right now, is it just not? Are we not that far along? Well, uh, your concern is a very valid one because both the things you mentioned have have been out there. I, I think if they do move to limit them, that it's much easier technically for them to put a, a, a million dollar limit or some dollar limit on the 1031 itself instead of looking to the income of the individual who's doing the exchange. So my guess if they moved in that direction, it would be a million dollars or some level, which is a fairly low level and it would end up causing a lot of damage even in itself. Uh, it's, kind of, uh, it's kind of insidious though because a lot of people will say, well, a million dollars is a lot, so how could that harm anybody? But uh, I think everybody on this call knows that a deal that's uh, higher than a million dollars uh, may not be that extensive. So we're very concerned about that. It would be a very serious matter if they did cap it at a million dollars or any dollar amount. So we're, we're pushing for, for keeping it just like it is. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Keith, for those questions. And thank you, Evan. Um, the next questions will come from myself, just a little matter of housekeeping. On your toggle down below where you can mute yourself, unmute yourself, or, or uh, look at all the participants and all that, there's a Q&A box you can click on in the audience to ask any question you'd like. So go ahead and ask any question you'd like. Uh, after the panelists are done, we're gonna open up to all the questions um, from the audience. So Evan, this question's for you. Uh, could you please explain in detail what budget reconciliation is and how the filibuster works and how would that work for preserving 1031? Well, we're gonna have to take until about uh, the next two hours for that, but I, I can try that to, uh, to uh, make it faster. The, the, the big problem or the big issue here is that the United States Senate has different rules than the House of Representatives does. And in the Senate, every member has the, the basic right to, uh, to continue talking as long as he or she wants to do it and to offer uh, amendments as much as under the general rules as they want to. 
And that, uh, th those two rights can bog down legislation. And uh, you've all heard of the idea of a filibuster or talking a bill to death by doing that. And the, the result is that uh, even one senator or more likely a small or determined minority of senators can slow down legislation by keeping it going, by talking it to death, by offering different amendments to it and so on. And uh, if it weren't for one provision in the Senate rules called the cloture, almost nothing would ever get done. But that cloture takes 60 votes to achieve. In other words, you, you can shut people down from filibustering by having 60 votes. And uh, as a result of the way those rules work, in most areas of, of a consideration in the United States Senate, you have to have 60 votes to get things done. But there's a major exception to that, and that's called what you mentioned, budget reconciliation. Budget reconciliation is a difficult or an arcane procedure that for some types of legislation can set up a situation where you can pass some bills with just a, a, a bare majority of uh, 51 votes, or in the case of our current Senate, with 50-50 with the vice president breaking the tie. So if it's on the Democratic side that wants something done, uh, and the vice president could break the tie, making it so that they were to win a 50-50 split. That is, is a possibility, but it's not an easy thing to achieve. Yet, it does appear, uh, based on what's happened this past week, that that's the way the Democrats are going to try to go with uh, probably both a, a bill to give further relief from uh, the COVID um, pandemic, uh, the extra $1,400 payment and all the other things they're talking about with extra money for vaccinations and minimum wage and so forth. And they may try to do it again later in the year to try to do infrastructure and tax increases. So the budget reconciliation technique is a very important one. It was what was used to pass the 2017 tax cuts. It was also what was used in 2010 to pass the Affordable Care Act, that, uh, more commonly known as Obamacare, it's been used many other times as well. And it, it allows the majority to push through something with, with, no, uh, with, with no support by the minority. If, in this case, they can get all 50 Democratic senators to, uh, to, to be as one and to, and to vote in it. Even all the Republicans voting against it can't stop it if they can get all 50 on, on board. That's a big if, though. Not only do they have to uh, get them to all finally pass it at the end, but even to set it up, you have to pass a budget resolution that takes 50, 50 votes or 51 votes, and, uh, and then it has to pass both houses of Congress. Assuming they can do that, and they're going to try to do this apparently in the House as early as next week for this COVID relief bill. Assuming they can do that, it was set up a situation where reconciliation instructions are given to various committees and uh, the, the goal is to have legislation drawn up by March that would take care of the, of the, of the $1.9 trillion COVID relief package the Democrats are looking for and could have it back for, for final votes in, in March before the unemployment insurance ends. That's the goal, it's very ambitious, it's theoretically possible. Uh, and maybe, it, maybe it's uh, something that can be done, but uh, there are a lot of people who are skeptical. The other alternative is for them to try to get bipartisan support which means getting at least 10 Republicans in the Senate to join all the Democrats and to, uh, and to do it that way. But that requires uh, some, some uh, modifications to what the, the president wants to do. And all indications are that they're not willing to, to, to reduce those amounts at this point. So what we're gonna have, I, I think, is probably gonna be a, an attempt at reconciliation. Whether they make it is anybody's guess, but. Uh, there's a lot of pressure to, to, uh, on Democrats to, to see that the new president succeeds. And so uh, I, I didn't think they were going to get the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act through reconciliation, but the Republicans were able to do it. And uh, maybe the Democrats can do, can do it uh, not once but twice this year, but we'll have to see. Evan, I think you're the first person to make reconciliation uh, 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 fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's so fun, all right. <laughs> and exciting, right? Uh, also, I think we mentioned, uh, we we're talking the other day about how <clears throat> Mansion uh, of West Virginia, is it? And then Cinema of Arizona has said they will not end the filibuster, right? That's right. And so it looks like that's not on the table right now, although it could be. If, if they're saying no, then there's no way they can change the rules. 
So reconciliation becomes the tool. And so how are people like uh, Senator Manchin and Sinema and, and others who are more moderate going to view big tax increases? How are they going to view things like getting rid of 1031 and other things in there? If they don't like them, you know, as I heard in another seminar yesterday, uh, every member of the Senate becomes the king or the queen of the Senate under these circumstances. They can make a big difference. So if, if you're the one who's holding up, you can, you can dictate what you want in that package within reason. So that gives us more leverage too when I'm talking about 1031 because we find some friends on the Democratic side who will hopefully stick up for us and, and keep 1031. Uh, Evan, uh, the last time uh, tax reform, I believe, was changed in the mid 80s. The last time it was uh, tax reform happened was 2017. In 2017, when the Republicans passed tax reform, it was a 54 46 GOP majority. In the House, it was a 241 194 GOP majority. And that was hard enough. Today, we have a 50 50 Senate with uh, uh, Vice President uh, Harris um, with a tiebreaker and a 221 211 difference in the House. How difficult would it be for a Biden administration to pass any tax reform? It's going to be challenging. What he has on his side, though, is that we are at a time when people want to see us more unified. And, and of course, all the Democrats want to see the president succeed. A lot of Republicans want to see the president succeed. And th th there's a lot of desires for people to want to work together. But I think that there's going to be a lot of, a lot of uh, frustrated Republicans if, if, uh, if the Democrats try to push reconciliation bills through, because that is kind of like a slap in the face saying, we don't think you're, you're going to ever want to cooperate with us, so we're going to do it our way or no way. So it, it, kind, of, it kind of ruins the atmosphere right off the bat, and it, it throws down the gauntlet. It, it makes it harder. I'm skeptical they can do it, but you know we, there's a lot of stake here, and we need to we, we need to continue to educate. We need to continue to work on this. Uh, the, the 1031 is in danger. I don't think it's I don't think it's imminently uh, ready to be repealed. But but we we need to be very aware that it could happen, and that we need to do all we can to, to save it uh, uh, as, as well as well as other tax provisions that could hurt real estate. Thank you, Evan. Um, next, I bring on Colin Cosgrove, my, my big boss and executive vice president in the Securities Corporation. Colin, go ahead. Evan, thank you very much for information today. Uh, really learned a lot. I, I love what you were saying about um, how it's often considered a tax dodge or a loophole, and that's probably caused a lot of concern and probably what brings this up in Congress all the time. You mentioned that in 2017 is the last time the 1031 was attacked. But of course, it was attacked in 2014 by both uh, the House and the, the Senate. I think the, that was David Camp at the time brought it up. And even on the executive side, I think uh, Keith mentioned as well that uh, Obama had his views also. President Obama at the time had his views on the 1031. Explain these past times that the 1031 was attacked and was it resolved in the same way or the same tack that we're taking now uh, to defend the 1031? I believe so. I, I think education is the real and the only answer here. People just don't quite get it. And, you know, you hear about members of Congress who think, oh, they've been here so long and they're all, all been around. But really, if you look at the, the roles of who's a member of Congress, you'll see there's huge turnover. And there are a lot of new people. And even if the members are still the same, the staff turn over very quickly. Somebody uh, on a staff level, Staying at the House and Senate for more than three years is a rare thing. And so there's always a need to go in and talk to these people, to let them know what's really going on and why this is important. And you have to be tireless in these efforts because there's just a lot of people that don't get it because they've never seen it or they forget it or they listen to those who are out there saying this is a way that people are getting away with murder by not paying their taxes. Just a follow there's a lot of there about the 1031 going away. Um, and you said short term, the likelihood it's probably, it's not going to happen. But long term, do you see this ever going away? You mean, the, you mean the threat going away? Yeah. Probably not. I, I think we're always going to have to be worried about, about this because it sound, it, 
you talk to the average person in the street and you tell them that you're able to, to buy this property and, and, uh, and uh, basically sell your old property. And they're gonna say, well, no tax? Why, how come you're so favored? And well, there's a lot of suspicion on the part of the average taxpayer that, uh, that a lot of people who are better off than they are, are are that way because they don't pay any tax. There's all these special rules just for the, the, the well-connected, the wealthy people that have a special tax code. You hear that kind of stuff all the time. But the reality is the wealthy pay a huge a portion of all the taxes paid, but uh, the, the common misperception is that they're, they're not paying their fair share. And it's easy to believe that if you don't know better. Thank you, Em. All right, uh, next we go to uh, Senior Vice President, uh, Government Relations Director, Mr. Dan Wagner. Hey, Evan, incredible presentation. Um, one of the things I, I, I look at is the coalition that uh, is working on this. You, you know, the, the concept of the strength of the wolf is the pack and the strength of the pack is the wolf. Um, could you uh, let people on this call know uh, to give them uh, good feelings of what is the power of, uh, of NAR, 1.4 million members. You know, there's, we had 10,000 realtors walking Capitol Hill last time. We, you, when you say coalition, uh, could, you, could you let people know what the coalition, like the Federation of Exchange Accommodators are amazing. Just, uh, just real quickly, the agriculture people, let people know um, the power that's there to, to be able to stand up on their behalf because it's a really big deal for everybody on the call. Great, great comment, Dan, and uh, that's very important. Uh, it's great to have a, an association as big as NAR working on this, but that's not enough. We have 1.4 million members and we're everywhere, but it's important for all advocates of, of, of commercial real estate to get together. And, and we have a number of very powerful and very solid uh, trade associations in the commercial real estate space. We have the Real Estate Roundtable. We have the, the Federation. We have uh, the shopping center people. We have uh, the, the office uh, offices people, uh, many, many others who, who all care about this. And uh, let me describe what I think is the best kind of meeting that could possibly happen in, in defense of 1031. It's, it's where a, a group of people are meeting with a senator in his or her home office or a representative in his or her home, home district office. And, they're, and the people who are, they're meeting with him are from, the, they're from that district and they're there uh, in maybe a dozen of them. And you've got a realtor there. You've got a commercial real estate professional there. You've got somebody who maybe has a shopping center, maybe owns a, a, a small one or an office building. You've got somebody else that, that, that uh, has done a 1031. And you have a bunch of these people that can all say, well, look, Senator, let me tell you how this works. And let me tell you what happened in this case and so on. And by the time they get through telling their story, that, that member is sitting there saying, wow, I, I, how come I didn't know that? that? That is really important to know. And thank you for telling me. The, the credibility that comes from a meeting like that where it's home, home state people and they're pointing out something just down the street that had this happen and how many jobs might have been created or how much good it did to the community. That's very, very powerful. And having that coalition of different kinds of people all in the room that can say the same kind of story uh, is the best it can, best as it can get. And uh, if people wanted to find out um, how did, you know, everybody on this call should, you know, like you said, try to reach out to their elected official. How do they do that, Evan? Well, everybody on this call is going to know, hopefully, who their elected official is, but some of them are going to have a, a personal connection or they're going to have somebody they know in their office or that works with them that does, that can get in to see them or if they're willing to join with others who are willing to reach out and, and try to get a group together like that, and to have a meeting like that, that's well organized, well, uh, co uh, well coordinated, th those meetings can take place all over the country. And so right. th think of examples, think of people who might be able to get in and, and visit with a member like that. I've been in many meetings like that and, and they can be very effective. I know the Federation of Exchange Accommodators website of www.1031.org um, has all the advocacy uh, white papers and um, it tells you how do you get, find out who your elected officials are. So I appreciate your time today. And um, Charles, I, I, that's my, those are my questions. Excellent, thank you, Dan.
I'm going to go to questions from the audience now, and I'm going to read these off to you, Evan, if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, the first question is this. Is someone's asking about who are all the lobbying entities that are helping to protect the 1031 right now? Well, it's largely, largely the group I mentioned. You know, we, we, we have the, the realtors and his, and his commercial affiliates. We've got the FBA. We've got the real estate roundtable, the, the, the shopping centers, uh, the, the folks who worry about, you know, the, the build apartment buildings, uh, that they uh, care about this and, and many others. There are uh, hotel, hotel associations. Uh, I'd say we could probably come up with a list of two, two dozen. Evan, the farm world too is a big deal, right? right. Like, Very good point, Dan. Farm. Yeah, oh. the people who care about land, agricultural land and, and other lands as well. Evan, there's a follow-up to the question. Um, uh, the question is this, is it's great that they're coordinated, uh, or they're, they're, that they're out there, but are, how are, well are they coordinated? Well, are they working together? We will be. As I say, next week we're going to have, have a, a meeting to start coordinating. We were very coordinated last time when we were facing the threat from the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. And, and I expect that we'll, we'll be having a weekly or bi-weekly meetings uh, starting up very soon. And yes, I'll be on that call, uh, Charles. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Uh, another question is, you know, for, for Biden, if 400000 is the line in the sand, um, how would that impact extra gains from, sale, uh, from a sale of property moving AGI excess of 400000 Well, unfortunately, you might have somebody that only makes 150000 or less in a particular year that if they sold property that had a big enough gain that could put them over that 400000 and they'd be considered wealthy even though that's the only year they might have it. And so that's, that's one reason why uh, calling the rich, uh, you know, the rich isn't always accurate because uh, they, they, might, they might not have uh, that kind of income every year, but the tax code is going to show that particular year they're wealthy. And if they have a line of 400,000, they're going to get hit. So it's, it's a problem. In, in your opinion, how many politicians actually know what a 1031 exchange is, if you put a percentage? Meaning members of the House and Senate? Yes. I'd say most of them have heard of it. How many actually understand it would be probably in the 30 to 40% range. So it sounds like we need a better job of education, right? Any last thoughts, Evan, before we start to wrap this up? Well, I, I'm just very happy to have this much participation uh, that we've seen on this call and, and uh, many other things going on around. Uh, it, it, it heartens me to know that, that, that folks are willing to, uh, to, to get involved on this issue and to, and to start educating. And so uh, we just need to keep it up. And uh, with great people like, like Inland, Dan Wagner and others who are uh, out there all the time, uh, there's no doubt in my mind that we can be successful. Excellent. It's a, it's a pleasure having you. It's a pleasure having all the panelists here today as well. Just want to thank you, uh, Mr. Decker from IPX, Bill Exer from uh, Exer 1031, Keith Lampy with Inland, uh, Mr. Wagner with uh, Inland as well, and uh, Colin Cosgrove. Uh, appreciate you all being here today. I think a big takeaway um, that I get from this is obviously advocacy is a big thing that we go out to help protect this industry and, and talk to our pol you know, the politicians that are, represent us. Uh, but also that I, I think it's not a bad time to look at doing an exchange at this time uh, to get in and, and hopefully get grandfathered in if that's what happens. So. Uh, we appreciate everyone being here today, and we're going to do a series of these, these uh, webinars educationally every month of this year. Thank you, Evan. All right. Thank you. Talk, take, talk to you later. Thank you. Thanks, Evan. Bye. Thanks, Charles. We'll see you. Thank you.